last speaker of today is CJ Silverio, aka SiegeBot. Uh, we, many of us know, and she works at NPM, and many of us know her for giving us robots. Uh, but today she's going to close out Cascadia JS by giving us some truth. CJ, everybody. All right. Are you wilted yet? Yeah, all right, let's, let's do this then. I'm gonna tell you guys a story. I'm gonna tell you guys the story of how I became a programmer. Do you wanna hear that? Yeah. All right, cool. But first, I'm gonna tell you the story of how my dad became a programmer. My dad became a programmer in the late 60s. He had two young daughters. He dr had dropped out of college to get a job to feed them and his wife. And he was a janitor at General Electric. He was pushing a broom. One day, while he was doing his janitorial job, he saw that there was a job posting on the wall. It said, on Monday at this time, show up here, take this test, and if you pass it, you'll get hired into the programming department at General Electric. So he went home, he went to the library, he spent his weekend studying. On Monday, he took the test, and then he started his new career because that's how you became a programmer in the late 60s. This was a pretty great career for him. I, it, I don't know if what I do at all, or what we do compares at all to what he did back in the era of punch cards and COBOL, but he seemed to like it. Um, years later, he was a hiring manager. I'm a teenager at this time. He comes home with this aptitude test, which he gives the candidates, and he says, you want to take this aptitude test? Sure, sure, Dad. Sure, I'll take the aptitude test. This aptitude test was the most fun thing I had ever done. It was awesome. It involved sequences of numbers where you had to guess what the next one would be or figure out what the next one would be. It had logic puzzles. I had a great time taking this test. My dad says, okay. He goes off and he scores it, you know, the old fill in the bubble kind. And later he says to me, yeah, that was the highest score I'd ever seen. Okay. He goes off, and a few months later, he comes back with an Apple II, and I start tinkering with computers. This is not, however, the story of how I became a programmer, because I'm not a programmer yet. I actually go to school and study math, because it turns out those numbers were pretty awesome, and I really fell in love with them. That first day, as I was a freshman in my number theory class, I, I was just besotted. So I got a degree in math. I took some CS classes, but it was all about the math. I go to grad school, and that doesn't work out so well. Grad school is not for me. I drop out, and I get a job. Not a programming job, because what I tell myself is that I'm not a programmer. I don't know how to write software. Sure, I had an Apple II. Sure, I played with computers. Sure, I took those classes. But I'm not a real programmer. I don't know enough. This job is hard. So I become a tech writer, which I think is a, a path a lot of women might identify with. I, this works out pretty well. And eventually I have a manager who says to me, do you want to write some software, CJ? I said, okay, maybe. I don't really know how to do it, but, but I think I'll try it. And then I became a programmer. Not because I believed I could, but because someone else believed I could. At that point, I actually have a pretty awesome career. I've worked on some really amazing projects that I'm proud to have worked on. If any of you ever used the T-Mobile Sidekick, my name is on every single one of those as a contributor. That is pretty fantastic. I start to learn how to write software. Maybe one of these years, one of these decades, I'll be good at it. But, you know, I get into open source. This is pretty great. I'm pretty proud of this. And then I discover Node, and it gets even better. I start showing up at conferences, places like this. I start maybe thinking you guys are kind of nice and I should hang out with you guys, and I do it. So I'm feeling pretty good. I've got the programming career, I'm doing open source, I've got a pretty fantastic job, 
I participate in the community. It's all great. This is the future we were all promised. And then one day, this happens. I don't know if you guys were paying attention to Node much at all. Somebody wants to fix some documentation to remove gendered pronouns. I'm a former tech writer. I know that the correct response to this PR is, gosh, thanks, I can't imagine why we drag gender into our technical documentation, because it doesn't belong there, and good style says don't do it. But this turns out to be a controversy. And as usual, it's the discussion afterwards that's way worse than the actual event, because the right thing happens with the documentation, and the right thing happens with the project, which has a policy, makes a policy for itself afterwards that this kind of mess can never happen again. But why did it happen at all? Why is my chosen community suddenly going out of its way to tell me that I don't belong? Because at this point, I've been a programmer for 25 years. It's, it doesn't occur to me to think that I might not belong here doing this job. And it's even more outraging because this call is coming from inside my house, people. <laughs> the, the monsters, the monsters in, in, in my cellar right now, this, this is not good. So this is a moment when I wake up and I look around myself after this comfortable, lovely career. And I say, OK, this is the future. What am I supposed to see around me now in this future? It's 25 years after I was too timid to become a software engineer. I don't see any women. I see you in the audience now. Please don't think I'm not seeing you right now. But when I look at Node Core, do I see any women on Node Core? No. Do I, how many women are, in, are involved in open source? It takes a lot of courage to be involved in open source, and we are in low numbers in software engineers and even lower in the open source communities. This isn't what I thought was going to happen. What I thought was going to happen was that in the future we'd get more women involved in software engineering, but in fact the opposite. So this is a graph of the percentage of degrees going to women in three different degree categories. As math, right here across the top, pretty steady, just below 50% of all math degrees go to women. It's about 1% of all degrees given. Here's CS, the blue line here. And then way at the bottom, traditional engineering. Your mechanical engineers, your electrical engineers. Look at, this is where I got my degree in math, 1987. This is where CS degrees going to women peaked. What? This wasn't supposed to happen. This number was supposed to go up until it like gets around here, which is where I want it to be, right? This, this I think, is, is what companies call the pipeline problem when they talk about hiring women. I want to talk about this pipeline problem just a little bit more. I'm going to give you some more numbers. You ready for numbers? Can you handle numbers in this heat? Yeah, all right. First number is the Google, 17%. That's the percentage of their tech workforce that is women. Google was founded in 1998. In 1998, 27% of all CS degrees went to women. Let's keep looking at this one. Yahoo, 15%. 1994, 28.5% no, of degrees go to women. Facebook, 15%, oh, doing, doing just as well as Yahoo. 2004, 22%. Here's this one, this is my favorite. Twitter, 10% engineering staff, women. They were founded in 2006 when the number, the degree pool was 18%. So I don't think we have a pipeline problem. Maybe Google gets to claim we have a pipeline problem. Nobody else does. What we have is a not trying problem. Our industry is regressive and regressing. It's not supposed to get worse, people. It's supposed to get better. And 
I'm a unicorn. Hooray! I, this is great. I don't want to be a unicorn. This is what I feel like. I feel like grumpy cat unicorn. Do you shy? You get to be a unicorn. You're out there, but I don't want to be a unicorn. Because unicorns don't exist. I'm a middle-aged woman. I write software. I work in open source. I love playing first-person shooter games. But the industry and the market pretend I don't exist. So I don't want to be a unicorn. I want to exist. I'll tell you another little story about unicornness. Last year, I went to Node Summit. I was a late invitation to a panel, a community panel at Node Summit. I was a late invitation because the conference organizer had gotten a little bit of grief because there weren't any women in, on his schedule. And he said, but I don't know any women in Node. So Raquel Velez, bless her, gave her a gave this guy a list of names, it included me, because it's last minute, most of the women involved can't actually show up, but I, but I show up. And I'm, I'm feeling a little testy, because it's right after this pronoun thing. And Disha, who's a very brave man, gave me a mic and let me say what was on my mind. And what I said was, the Node.js project should recruit women. Women are not involved in open source for a bunch of reasons. It's a pretty scary, occasionally nasty environment. I think the JavaScript community is an amazing example of not nasty and nice. But women are very hesitant to get involved in open source. If the Node core wants women involved, it should find someone, recruit them specifically, and help them grow into the role. And I said this to an audience of people that included Node core. What happened? Cheap, cheap, cheap. <laughs> Nothing. Okay, now what? I'm a software engineer. I solve problems. You present me with a problem. The first thing I'm going to be doing is thinking, okay, what am I going to do to fix this? So I started thinking, let's figure it out. Let's fix it. I have to take direct action. I see a problem. Let's crush it. How did I become a unicorn? It's a great question to ask, right? I think I know the answer. My friend Laura LeMay puts it this way. I succeeded at doing what I'm doing because I am stubborn and oblivious. These are awesome adjectives. I'm going to show you how awesome they are. You ready? Here's, we're going to role play this one. Girls don't program computers or do math. Stubborn. Screw you. I'm going to do it anyway. Oblivious. Sorry, didn't notice. Too busy publishing another module. <laughs> Win. I write software, right? Win? Yeah? I don't, I don't actually think so. I, I think uh, uh, not everybody wants to be as thick-skinned as I am. In fact, I'll go one step further on this one. People shouldn't have to be that thick-skinned to succeed in software. Yes. You should be able to do this job if you want to, and you're excited about it, and you want to learn about it. So I decided, like, because all change starts with yourself, I asked myself, what should I be? What's a better set of adjectives? So, all right, I'm going to try on determined and empathetic. Let's, let's do our little role play again. Women don't write software. I'm going to do what I want. You notice it's almost the same, but it lacks one thing. I'm not mad. Right? I think that's a new step for the better. Empathetic. The person who's saying that to me has probably said it to somebody else. Who was that? Could they use my help? Okay, that was, my, that was my big moment. I'm still chewing on that one. What does this have to do with you? Yeah, you, dude in the back. You ready? 
I'm going to give you painful truth. How you act is what your values are. What you talk about tells me what you want me to think your values are. How you should look to other people. What you actually do in real life tells me what you value deep down. If you value diversity in our profession, look at what you've done about it. Hey, hiring managers. Got any hiring managers out here? Yeah, okay. We got a few of you. Good. I, I'm going to talk to you now a little bit about this. I'm not going to pick on you. <laughs> Why am I a unicorn? I think if you hire a team like this, let's imagine that photo stretching off for a while. I think you weren't trying. You didn't value diversity in a way that made you act. But it's hard, you tell me. Okay, here's your tombstone. RIP, your name here. You only worked on easy problems. Well done. <laughs> no one's going to give you any credit for that. Kitten time, kitten time, kitten time, kitten time. Because <laughs> I just yelled at you, and I, I feel bad about that because I don't. Actually, I've, I have infinite sympathy for you. I've been you. I've been the hiring manager saying, how can I possibly do anything here? I'm not getting any resumes. Ah. But I love you. I know it's hard. And I know you're actually trying. And you're wondering, how do you juggle your responsibilities to your team to hire the best team you possibly can and your values, which say, hey, wait, diversity is good. Diversity, it's something you should do. Okay, be determined, be determined with me. It's easier than you fear it is. You're gonna be determined and you're gonna be empathetic. Everything that happened in the previous two days has told you why this will make your team better. You heard from Kate Hudson about cognitive diversity. You heard talks today about what diversity does for your team. It's going to be a win, stay with it. I'm going to give you some tips about how. You ready? Practical tips. Step one, say it matters in your job listings. Doesn't have to be complicated. You don't have to go on for this about this for a long time. We care deeply about making tech a more inclusive and diverse place. That's from NPM's hiring listings. That's a great example. This signals to people who might be giving you a resume that your job place, your workplace is safe. It's a place where they might be welcome, where they're not gonna get grief. Women tend to be very conservative about job moves. And they tend to move to places they know are gonna be okay. And if they're in a place where they're okay, they tend not to wanna move because why take the risk? Tell them clearly that it's gonna be okay where you are. Step two. Enlist your team's help. Here's a tip. If you have women or you have other groups on your team who you want to see more representative, have them interview every candidate that comes through. Remember what I said about signaling that your workplace is a safe place? This does that. It says, I won't be the first. I'm okay with being the first woman in, or the only woman in engineering because I just got used to that, but most people don't want to be that. Tell them they're not going to be the first. You know, this has an, a really great side effect, too. It weeds out people who have, would have a problem working with women or people who don't look the same way they do. Awesome thing to do. Step three, you ready? Freaking do it. Hire somebody who doesn't look like everybody else. I got... You've been making conservative, safe, boring choices all along. Take the risk. Hire somebody who doesn't look like everybody else on your team. But CJ, I can't do that. I only hire the best. I have bad news for you. Your hiring process sucks. <laughs> I'll tell you, 
No, I actually know how it sucks because you just told me it sucks. You told me you value diversity and your hiring process isn't producing it. So something's going wrong, right? You're not getting what you say you want. None of us know how to interview people. But yes, people trick questions about how much water flows through the Mississippi. And you know, this, is this actually gonna produce a great teammate? You know, someone who can answer that? I think Google has data on that one. It doesn't. They, their data actually is kind of depressing. It says, yeah, we have no idea how to interview either. So nothing is going to guarantee success here, but I want you to take a risk. Find the candidate who doesn't look like everybody else and try hiring them. You have subconscious biases, like Jason, who was just before me. I just read that, that research about what having a, a male white name does to people recruiter's reaction to your resume, adding eight years of experience, that's, okay, that's you, that's me. We're all doing that when we read resumes, unconsciously. I'm asking you to back that up if you can. You're not diverse, you need to be, you heard this earlier. I gotta tell you another little secret. This is another secret aimed at you hiring managers. It's about the cultural differences between how men and women get trained. Do you remember I told you this little story earlier about how I grew up with a dad who was very proud of me with his, my aptitude for writing software. He gave me this aptitude test and he told me what the results were. Do you remember how I didn't believe that later on? Actually, it was profoundly uncomfortable for me to even say that to you guys. Just like mentioning, it feels like bragging about something that like really doesn't matter very much. That is the culture working on me to understate all of my accomplishments and what I do. I'll give you another little example of this. You give a guy an opportunity to make a conference presentation. He's like, yeah, I, I read a blog post on that last year. I'll, I'll present on that, no problem. Pitch the same idea to a woman. She said, well, I did my master's work on it, but I'm not the foremost in my field. Maybe you should talk to my team leader. Uh, that's an exaggeration, right? But you know this trend, right? And, and I'm here to tell you, I, I feel this, this beats down on me. Why am I telling you this? Because that candidate you're looking at, who looks kind of junior, might not ne be nearly as junior as they say they are. That brash white guy, he's been taught, yeah, apply for all the jobs. He's probably not as senior as he looks because unconscious bias is affecting us every time we look at people. Okay, I'll tell you the upside of that. You're gonna get that woman candidate for cheap. I'm gonna fix that one, but get them now while you can afford them. This is what my team looks like. This is actually the payoff to my, my complaint to Node Core back in last December, Isaac hired uh, where his values were when he went to found NPM. I would not call this perfect, but I would call this trying. I think we're pretty kick-ass too. I think we do a good job. Okay, I finished beating up hiring managers. You, you feeling nice and brutalized? Okay, let's go, let's move on to the men in the audience. Getting time. <laughs> I love you guys too. You've been my colleagues for the last 25 years. If I didn't love you, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have lasted, right? And I know that you're decent human beings, and I know that you try, especially a crowd like this one. Um, you all are wonderful. Let's move beyond just not being horrible to women, and let's do a little bit better than that, okay? I wanna talk about a thing that may not get acknowledged here. When we talk about hiring people who don't look like you, it feels a little bit like we're picking on you. And you may be scared of losing something, losing maybe at like some kind of primal level your jobs, right? Because we're talking about more competition I don't think this is gonna happen. I think software is going to eat the world. I think, who said that, Mark Andreessen? I think he's right. 
I think I have seen this industry do nothing but get larger and larger over the years. And I think it's just going to keep doing that. It's going, we have a talent shortage, not a job shortage. Don't be scared of losing your jobs. Your teams are going to get more awesome because they're going to have more diverse people in it. That's what's going to happen to you. You're going to be OK. I need you to do something that I can't do. I gotta tell you a really depressing thing. You know what the number one potential side effect of me being up here at this stage talking to you about this is? Death threats and rape threats on Twitter and in my inbox. If we were the games industry, that would probably already be happening while I'm still on stage. Now, you guys aren't doing it. You aren't the ones, but you, maybe have a better chance than I do of knowing who's doing it. The Australian Army had a has a problem with sexual harassment in its ranks. Lieutenant General David Morrison said this in a video address to his army. The standard you walk past is the standard you accept. I would really like you to stop bad behavior when you see it. This is the thing you can do that I can't. I really need your help here. It's going to suck. Because sometimes, people you used to respect are going to turn out to be those people who are being complete jerks. Or just not even complete jerks, just being oops. You got to do it. Stand your ground here. Take, please get my back. All right. My fellow unicorns. Those of us who don't exist, I see you. You're here. Anybody who, women, people who identify as women, anyone who doesn't match the model. I don't have a kitten for you. <laughs> I need you. You know, you know, I don't have a kitten for you. Because what I'm worried about with you is losing you from the profession. 56% of women in programming in tech leave the profession by mid-career. This is, this is really secretly why I'm a unicorn. I, you know, I had some of you with me earlier, but you all left. I'm left standing here. You could be great at this. You're worth it. You're good at it already. You want to be great at it? You can do it going to take work because going to be great at anything takes work but you can do that apply for that job give those hiring managers a little bit of a break would you apply for those jobs and not over your heads you can get them you're not going to get all of them but be daring stay determined stay with me people i need company i don't want to be alone up here I don't want to be a unicorn. It's OK if you find something you like doing better than writing software. No problem. Go do what you love. But if you love doing this, damn it, I'll be damned if I see you driven out by this. Stay with me. So this is my resolution. After that event, after that little pronoun thing, and then my little challenge that was greeted with silence, the year and going to help other women. I don't know how. I'm going to figure out how. I'm pushing 50 right now. I don't really want to be up here in 2024 20, pushing 60 saying, yay, Twitter, you hit 12%. Well done. I, I, let's Come on, man. Let, give me the future. <laughs> give me a future of, of equality and everyone getting to do what they want to do for a living and have a great time so that we can make the world a better place with software, with all the talent that's in the talent pool waiting to work, they're doing it. I'm not a hero. I'm happy as sitting in a corner with headphones on, running code. Really, this is, like, this is not a comfortable thing for me up here talking to you guys. There's one thing I can do, though. Um, I can be someone who looks like you 
doing this thing successfully sort of a role model or more of like an existence proof? I can't do this by myself, right? Yeah, here I am, I exist. I'm a unicorn, I exist. I can't do this by myself because I don't look like everybody who might want to be doing this, who isn't representative. I didn't have this when I was coming up through the ranks through the 80s and the 90s. I didn't know that I needed it, but I think it's necessary. I'd really like to do it. This is my new look. You know what this is? This is an icebreaker. This is a big giant ship with this huge metal prow, and it just smashes into Arctic ice and breaks it. I think this is a really good job for somebody who's uh, stubborn and oblivious. It might also really work well for someone who's going to try to be determined and empathetic. I, I don't want to be a unicorn here either. If you can join me and my little crew of icebreakers, please do it. There are other people who need representation. I need help. Help me.